There are diversities of ministries, the same Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. In addition to it being the tenth Sunday after Pentecost, we also find ourselves here on the great feast day of St. Martha. Martha, as most of you well know, was a faithful woman who lived in Bethany uh, throughout her life, and she herself was one of the very first to hear our Lord speak. She was one of the very first people to recognize him as he was, to recognize him to be the Messiah, the promised one that she had been long waiting for. And her and her brother, Lazarus, they came again and again to hear him. They listened as often as they possibly could. If it were in today's times, you'd say that they'd probably tune into, you know, SGG, uh, you know, recordings of sermons or traditional Catholic sermons on the internet to listen to our Lord. But of course, then they had to travel about and, and go and actually see him and hear him in the flesh. And every time it drew them nearer and nearer to Christ. And it was actually by finding the impact of our Lord's words themselves, that she was able to influence her own sister, her fallen away sister, Mary Magdalene. She brought her along with her to the sermons of, of our Lord. And Magdalene was there, and, and she would listen to him. And while she hadn't turned away from her sinful life yet, it is those sermons, those, those words that he spoke, that began to soften her heart began to open her up to, to divine influence and grace that one day would lead to her conversion back to God and a turning away from that sinfulness. And as that devotion to Christ grew, and as the nearer they came to him, our Lord began to recognize them as uh, people who frequently came to see him speak. And they began to, to get to know them and talk to them and learned who they were. And he befriended them and soon found himself at their house, not just once, but several times visiting there. It's said of our Lord going to Bethany and staying at the house of Lazarus and, and his two sisters that, that it was one of his favorite places for him to come to. It, perhaps it was because they were so genuine that they made him feel right at home. They were truly friends and followers of, of himself. And when it's there that we find ourselves with the most commonly uh, expressed, uh, expressed story of St. Martha. It's there at the home. Our Lord arrives there and... St. Martha is, is, is really looking to see what she can do to be a good host, not only to the visitor that they have, which would be enough in and of itself, but also to God, who is now under her roof. And so she's going about everything, making sure that everything's just perfect, cleaning, organizing, cooking, setting table, doing all of the work of that house to be that good hostess to our Lord Jesus Christ. And yet all the while, while our Lord is casually talking there and, 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 and speaking to those, those other people that are at the home, her sister, Mary Magdalene, sits there right beside our Lord's feet and just listens to those words spoken. Those same, that same voice that brought her back from sinfulness, she sits there and just observes and doesn't do anything to help in the organization of the house. And soon enough, Martha realizes that and, and becomes a little disturbed by it, and mildly complains to our Lord and asks him if, she, if, he, if he could speak to her and get her to help out a bit with all the tasks. But our Lord turns to Martha and says to her, Martha, Martha. Thou art careful and troubled by many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the best part, which shall not be taken from her. That simple phrase, it's kind of looked over or passed over. It's part of the story that we all know. But it's, a, it's that phrase that was a major watershed moment in the life 
of St. Martha. Not in a, in a way that made her, uh, you know, realize that she, that, that to change her to, to finding that our Lord was the Messiah, she already believed that wholeheartedly, or that she needed to follow him. She already knew that already. But as a watershed moment to realize that not everybody in vocation is the same. And it was remarkable in two ways for her. First off, that there are different vocations in life. And that we are called to different tasks and different ways to serve God. For Mary Magdalene, she was chosen for the contemporary the contemplative of life. That would later come to be most apparent after our Lord is dead, after he's already ascended into heaven, and, um, and, and the church has begun with the descent of the Holy Ghost. All of those events, both of St. Mary Magdalene and St. Martha, were present for, and yet they took totally different paths once they were put upon that boat towards France. Mary Magdalene embraced that contemplative of life. She retreated completely away from the world. She entered into a cave. She lived by herself. And there she just prayed and performed acts of penance all the rest of her days, completely shutting her off, self off from the world and being wholly and entirely devoted to pray to our Lord. But for Martha, it was chosen for her that active, a more active life for her. That's why our Lord doesn't correct her on the, the, all the, the tasks that she's going about. It is a good thing that she was doing. Yet, it was not that calling to that higher plane of pure contemplative nature that she was, brought, was meant to be. And so, it was for her a more active life that would be awaiting her. She'd become very influential as a woman throughout early Christendom. She would be the source or the vessel by which many a young lady was converted to the faith. Every opportunity that she had to, 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 to speak about the truths that she had heard come directly from our Lord's mouth and to, and to speak of the miracles that she had seen with her own eyes and all the great things that she had witnessed from our Lord directly. Every opportunity that she had, she took for herself. She took and she converted so many souls to Catholicism. And it was through that example that she saw in our Lord that she embraced that role of charity every single day of her life. She went out of her way to service the poor. She went out of her way to look after the sick and the needy and to, to, to help her fellow neighbor whenever they were in need. Yet, and it was that source of charity that inspired even more to come and follow her in leading a life serving God. Secondarily, Martha learns that the act of life cannot be purely active. It was good that she was serving God, uh, our Lord at the table there, and it was necessary, but that she cannot forget about the need of her own contemplation in her life. Our Lord says this to her when he said, but one thing is necessary. And then he indicates that, that Mary has chosen the higher part. But he says that the one thing, that is the one thing that is necessary. It's common to all of us. There's a part of us that has to be contemplative, no matter how active we are. St. Martha eventually mixes those two lives together into one. She takes some of those people, those young ladies, those that had begun to follow her and to listen to her tell about our Lord, she takes them and they begin to live a religious, of what would be like a, a, the first religious communal life. They live together as, uh, as consecrated virgins of our Lord and they spend great times retreated from the world in prayer and in penance with each other, to, you know, praying together and encouraging each other towards growth. Yet they still at times would go out and perform those works of charity and, and still at times be able to mix and with the people and talk to them about what they knew about our Lord. And this mixing of the contemplative and the... <clears throat> 
and the active life was the great lesson, was the second great lesson that St. Martha learned from that simple comment from Christ himself. So impactful was it that she did it every day. She did it every day for 30 years, living that, that religious life, until one day, while praying, she saw her own sister, St. Mary Magdalene's soul, being lifted up into heaven, carried by angels up into the sky to rejoin their master, our Lord Jesus Christ. She rejoiced at that sight, and she longed for it, too. She longed to join her sister once again. Eight days later, it was her turn to enter into eternity. So, with that understanding of St. Martha, what do we learn for ourselves? What do we, who have active lives, take away from that? Well, I think the obvious takeaway is that our day-to-day -day lives need to be prayerful. Our day-to-day -day lives need to maintain a level of contemplative nature, contemplative source for itself, in order to be the strength of all the active things on all the duties that we perform throughout the day. It's only by that that we can be, be lifted up. A man who doesn't pray cannot save his soul. But one great place for us to start, and one point that I want to, to kind of indicate as an, as an important area, is our preparation for Holy Communion. Because in that regard, we see that direct connection to today's saying. St. Martha took great care and took great time and took great effort to prepare her home every time Christ came to visit it, every time he came under her roof, all that labor went into it to make it a place that he wanted to come back to time and time again. And our Lord's visits to us are so much more intimate than even that. It's not that he comes under our roof, but he comes under our body. He comes into us through Holy Communion and dwells within us. And so for us, we too need to prepare ourselves for this. We need to come a bit early for Mass and take that time to sit in quiet and to, to pray to our Lord and to ask you know, to do some devotions and then sometimes just have a meditative thought and prayer in preparation for our communion. The whole world around us is surrounded us with distractions and noise and varying thoughts and from we, we flip from one thing to another, one, two, three, by all that is around us. Yet it's here that we can leave all of that outside the walls, all of that behind us, and quiet our soul for once in time in preparation for our own communions. But we have to take that time of preparation in order to gain that quiet, in order to gain that, that, that level of understanding and preparedness for just what we're about to receive. We need to take that time because when we know that when we prepare ourselves well, while the sacramental graces do not change the actual graces that we can, um, that we can be able to receive, increase and we, can, and we can profit from each communion even more by good preparation. We need to come and confess our sins regularly. Martha cleaned the house. We need to clean ours. Even though we might not have grave sin, it's still always very good to have that regular practice. And it allows us also to be regular, well, by being regular in our practice, it keeps our faults before us so we can continue to work at them, to correct them. It allows us to also be able to receive plenary indulgences on a regular basis by our repetitive repeated confessions as that is an element of what is necessary for plenary indulgences. And so that good confession is that sweeping out of our house. And afterwards, we need to make a good thanksgiving for what we have received. Our Holy Communion, it's the greatest of spiritual gifts, the greatest of privileges for us to be able to receive. God here upon earth, God with us, always. And there 
present within us. We have to be so thankful for such a great gift. Now, we find in that preparation, in that good prayerful surrounding ourselves of communion, a perfect representation of Saint Martha. A blend between the active and the contemplative wrapped up in one simple thing. We prepare. It's an active thing. It's a, we force ourselves to come here early. We force ourselves to stay a bit later. We go to confession. We set aside prayers. We say those prayers. We do all of these things to, to, that are active in their own nature. And yet, at the center of it, we find that the object is the contemplation of Christ. Our action brings us to his feet, like Magdalene. And it's the combination of the two, the active and the passive, that one that will make us that place where our Lord can say, there is one of my favorite places to dwell and long to come back to us time and time again. May God bless you. In the name of the Father and the Son.